I get asked a lot of questions about, you know, where we came up with the original Voodoo name for the Voodoo base. And that happened in 1992. I was designing the base. I didn't have a name for it. And I happened to be in a hobby store uh, picking up some supplies. And I look up and here's this model kit for a McDonnell Douglas F-101 Voodoo fighter jet. And I thought, wow, that'd be a great name for a base. One year later, um, we displayed it now. When, when I say we, it was Ralph Novak and I, we shared a booth. Really cool that Charlie Hunter was uh, demoing at the booth, uh, Ralph's Guitars. This was one of the Primas that uh, we took to that show. So this is one of the very first or bass guitars that, uh, that we built. This was 1994. This one came home with me. The other one went to Germany and that kick-started uh, Dingwall Guitars in Europe. Back in those days, we were buying maple locally and it was hard to get a really nice piece of maple. So what we'd do is we'd slice um, a four quarter piece of maple in half. And if we could use both halves, great. If not, we'd throw away one half and use the other half that was still good and glue them up into a neck block. We used Spurzel locking tuners back then, a custom Bartolini pickups and a Bartolini two band EQ with a blend. We came up with the Prima model in 1994. We had the Voodoo Zebra and the Voodoo Prima. Now on the very first uh, Voodoo based designs, the center line of the body seemed to be a little bit towards the treble side. And that was just because I didn't trust uh, my visual intuition. I was trying to come up with a mathematical center line and, and that just doesn't work. That evolved in about 1999 when we shaved off the cello hip and recentered the body to become what's now known as the Z. And so this would be the modern version. Um, I'm happy with the way the strings are centered within the body. I have no idea if there's a mathematical connection, but it's visually, that's, that's what's most important. The next evolution was the afterburner, and we needed something that was easier to manufacture, therefore we could sell it at a, at a more attractive price point. I remember street price on this base in the year 2000 was 1200 US, if you can imagine that. A couple of the things that got us to um, more efficient manufacturing was a heelless design, so this is much easier to sand and buff. The control cavity is all um, inside curves, and so it's very easy to, to uh, machine. Flat headstock, that was the first for Dingwall. This base has been in continuous production for 23 years. I'm, I'm very proud of that. This is also what inspired the combustion, um, which was our first uh, attempt at uh, outside manufacturing. And the combustion was such a hit that it attracted a, this young bass player named Adam Nolly Getgood. Adam bought uh, two combustions and took them out on tour and he had such success with them that he came to us and he said, I'd like to work with you on a signature model. And that became the NG that uh, we all know and love. So people often ask me, um, you guys build basses, why do you call yourselves Dingwall Guitars? And the reason is, is that we started on guitars. Um, this model was made in roughly 1995. Um, it's a really thick swamp ash body, maple top, Really interesting pickup combination where these three pickups are on the five position rotary and then the uh, lead pickup is on a toggle switch. Floyd Rose, one piece maple neck, uh, Pau Ferro fingerboard. We've been using Pau Ferro since day one. And if you notice, there's a similarity to the headstock. This has always been our headstock shape. And um, I really miss building guitars, uh, but I'm really happy building basses.